Welcome to the second module on cardiovascular medications. This presentation will be a review of coronary artery disease and its implications for physical therapists and physical therapist assistants who may be treating patients recovering from COVID-19. The objectives of this section are for the learner to define coronary artery disease, list the modifiable risk factors for coronary artery disease, including those amenable to physical therapy interventions, to describe the physiologic effects of coronary artery disease and the pathophysiology, to discuss the types of drugs used to manage coronary artery disease, and the potential adverse effects of common medications. Heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. Every 40 seconds, someone in the United States has a heart attack or myocardial infarction. It is important to note that 20% of heart attacks go unnoticed. Either the person has no symptoms, they don't perceive those symptoms, or they ignore their symptoms. So what is coronary artery disease? CAD is also known as coronary heart disease. It is caused by atherosclerosis, otherwise known as hardening of the arteries. It is a plaque buildup in the coronary arteries which limits blood flow to heart muscle. As CAD progresses, blood flow becomes more and more limited, which can lead to angina, or angina. Angina is defined as discomfort that occurs above the waist with physical exertion or emotional stress. It is a warning sign that the heart is not getting enough oxygen, that the heart is becoming ischemic. Left untreated, coronary artery disease can lead to more frequent bouts of ischemia, a heart attack, myopathy, or heart failure, and even sudden death. It is important to note that without blood work and an EKG, it's impossible to tell the difference between angina, which is temporary, and a heart attack, which is permanent. So they are both included under the umbrella term of acute coronary syndrome. If you suspect a patient is in acute coronary syndrome, you need to activate EMS immediately, because if treated soon enough, the damage from a heart attack can be minimized. What are the potential signs and symptoms of a heart attack? Sometimes the first sign of a heart disease is angina. There are six primary risk factors that can be modified. These include having high blood sugar, high blood pressure, being a smoker, being physically inactive, having high cholesterol, or being overweight or obese. There's also a link here that is used to calculate the 10-year risk of heart disease or stroke. This calculator includes both modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. It is important to note that physical therapists play an important role in preventing or reducing all six of these modifiable risk factors. Coronary artery disease falls under the category of cardiovascular disease. Other types of cardiovascular disease include cerebrovascular disease, which is, can be manifested by a transient ischemic attack, again, which is temporary, versus a stroke, which is permanent brain damage, as well as peripheral arterial disease, which has the temporary symptom of intermittent claudication or leg pain with exertion. The common pathology that links all of these types of cardiovascular disease is atherosclerosis or the plaque buildup in the arteries. Thus, it is important to consider that patients likely have atherosclerosis throughout their arteries and not in just one organ or tissue. Thus, if you're working with a patient who has had a stroke, they're likely also at risk for having a heart attack. Similarly, a patient with peripheral artery disease is at risk for having a stroke or a heart attack. Thus, be alert for these emergency conditions to develop when working with any of these patient populations. Coronary artery disease is associated with an increased risk of hospitalization and death due to COVID-19. Over 10% of patients admitted with COVID-19 had coronary artery disease, and nearly 90% of patients admitted for management of COVID-19 had more than one of these comorbidities. In addition, the death rate from COVID-19 is three times higher than the overall death rate. Why does COVID-19 have a higher risk of severe disease and mortality in patients with CVD? 
Although not unique to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, viral infections increase the risk of myocardial infarction, heart failure, and dysrhythmias by a variety of mechanisms but especially by inducing a systemic inflammatory response, by increasing sympathetic stimulation, and by putting the patient in a hypercoagulable state. Thus, all patients with heart disease should be vigilant about hand washing and preventing an infection on a normal day, but they need to be extra vigilant about protecting themselves during this current pandemic. So how is coronary artery disease managed pharmacologically? The three main strategies are increasing oxygen supply to the heart, decreasing oxygen demand of the heart, and managing the risk factors for coronary heart vascular disease. We'll look at each of these separately. Oxygen supply to the heart can be increased by relaxing the coronary arteries. This is most commonly done with vasodilators. Non-DHP Calcium channel blockers like giltiazem can also be used. In addition, antiplatelet drugs such as aspirin or Plavix can be used. Nitroglycerin has its mechanism of action as a vasodilator by being converted to nitric oxide, which is a potent vasodilator. So it relaxes vascular smooth muscle uh, to open up the vessels to deliver more oxygen and blood to the heart. The adverse effects are associated with this vasodilation. Perhaps a headache as one isn't getting enough oxygen to the brain, hypotension, especially orthostatic hypotension. Thus, patients taking nitroglycerin, especially rapidly acting like sublingual or spray preparations, should do so in sitting to prevent falls and syncopal episodes. When used to treat angina, up to three sublingual tablets can be taken within 15 minutes, plus five minutes apart. If the first dose does not resolve the angina, then the patient may be having a heart attack and EMS should be activated. When EMS does arrive, make sure to tell them how many doses of nitroglycerin have been administered. Another way to improve oxygen supply to the heart is to prevent thrombus formation by decreasing platelets, the platelet's ability to stick together at the site of an injury, often where there's a rupture of plaque within the coronary artery. Aspirin can also be given, chewed, not swallowed, if the patient is in acute coronary syndrome. One of the major adverse effects of aspirin is bleeding. This can be especially an issue in patients with an increased fall risk, as they could develop cerebral bleeding if they were to fall and hit their head. A second potential way to manage coronary artery disease is to decrease the oxygen demand of the heart, to keep it below the threshold at which ischemia and angina occur. This is done primarily with beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, both which can reduce heart rate and contractility of the heart, and thus cardiac output and the amount of work the heart is doing. As illustrated in the previous module on antihypertensive medications, beta blockers reduce both heart rate and blood pressure and can prevent the heart from reaching the angina threshold. The work of the heart can be assessed as the rate pressure product, or heart rate times systolic blood pressure. Angina typically occurs at a reproducible rate pressure product. Thus, if the patient stays below a certain rate pressure product, angina can be prevented. Lastly, modifying risk factors is important in both the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease, but it is also important in secondary prevention, minimizing the progression of the disease. These include managing blood pressure, blood sugar, smoking cessation, increasing physical activity, weight loss, and managing cholesterol. Lifestyle modifications, which all involve behavior change, are important for modifying all of these risk factors. Medications can assist in modifying many of these risk factors as well, with the exception of physical activity. Pharmacologic management of hypertension and diabetes are discussed in separate modules of this course. Thus, the only specific drug therapy we will now discuss is for management of cholesterol. Total cholesterol is the sum of bad cholesterol, or LDL, 
good cholesterol, HDL, and triglycerides. Ideally, total cholesterol should be below 200. The lower the better. Hypercholesterolemia is defined as a total cholesterol of greater than 240. This slide illustrates there's both bad cholesterol, LDL, as well as good cholesterol, or HDL. LDL is associated with plaque buildup in the coronary arteries, while HDLs are associated with plaque removal from the coronary arteries. HMG coenzyme A reductase inhibitors, otherwise known as statins, are quite prevalent. Lipitor is the second most prescribed medication in the United States, and two more statins are in the top 25 most prescribed medications. Statins do exactly what you would want. They lower the bad cholesterol and raise the good cholesterol, but they are not without their adverse effects, which we'll discuss shortly. Other less commonly used medications for dyslipidemia include niacin or vitamin B3, which is especially helpful in raising HDL, and Zetia. Zetia works by blocking the absorption of cholesterol from the GI tract into the blood, and thus the adverse effects of it include GI distress, distress. But we'll focus our attention on the statins. Statins are indicated for many patients, especially anyone with known cardiovascular disease caused by atherosclerosis. Anyone with a bad cholesterol or LDL greater than 190, people age 40 to 75 that either have diabetes or without diabetes and have an LDL between 70 and 190 and a greater than 5% 10 year risk of developing cardiovascular disease, as well as most patients over age 75. This clinical decision making is process is illustrated in the following diagram from a clinical practice guideline on the management of hypercholesterolemia. Statins work by blocking the enzyme HMG coenzyme A reductase, which is important in the pathway for cholesterol production. Thus, by blocking this enzyme, uh, cholesterol production is inhibited. The adverse effects of statins begin with muscle injury, but as muscle injury occurs and is metabolized by the liver and excreted by the kidney, then both hepatic and renal complications can occur. Thus, we'll focus on the effects of statin on skeletal muscle. The spe spectrum of effects of statins on skeletal muscle include myalgia, myopathy, myositis, myonecrosis, and clinical rhabdomyolysis. The initial phase may just be myalgia or muscle discomfort, including aches, soreness, stiffness, tenderness, or cramps, especially when they occur with or soon after exercise. Creatine kinase might be normal in this case. With a myopathy, there's actual muscle weakness that's occurring. With myositis, there's actual inflammation that can be assessed. With myonecrosis, it can be evaluated as mild, moderate, or severe, depending on the elevation of creatine kinase in the blood. The most severe form is clinical rhabdomyolysis, the point at which muscle is breaking down and causing acute renal failure. How are these potentially detrimental adverse effects managed, and what role does phys do physical therapists play? PTs can play a role in monitoring strength of patients on statins. The use of handheld dynamometry can be a way to objectively assess muscle strength. If patients are getting weaker after beginning a statin, then reporting these ad this adverse effect to a physician, as well as its impact on a patient's function, can be important. The physician may then decide to lower the dose of the statin, uh, to stop the statin, or to switch to another um, brand of a statin. It is also important to have a, an appropriate therapeutic exercise prescription. Uh, patients that are unaccustomed to vigorous exercise might be at higher risk of muscle injury. Thus, it is best to make changes in exercise more gradual, having a warm-up and an appropriate progression. 
The use of coenzyme A or coenzyme Q10 supplements is controversial. They may help prevent the side effects, um, but the evidence is, um, is not conclusive that these will help. In summary, since heart disease is one of the most prevalent health conditions in the United States, patients coming to physical therapy for other conditions are likely to have heart disease as a comorbidity. Physical therapists play an important role in monitoring for the adverse effects of exercise. These adverse effects could be due to angina brought about by higher levels of physical activity or even muscle discomfort, weakness, and inflammation brought on by the combination of exercise and statin therapy. PTs should recognize the impact of med certain medications and make appropriate modifications. For example, heart rate may not be the most appropriate way to monitor intensity of patients on a beta blocker. Plyometrics and other high-intensity resistance training may not be appropriate for patients on statin therapy. And we may want to contact the physician if a patient is at a high fall risk and yet they're on an antiplatelet therapy. Lastly, physical therapists are an ideal healthcare provider to provide lifestyle modifications to help modify risk factors associated with the development and progression of coronary artery disease. We should guide patients into motivating themselves to stop smoking, to be more physically active, to make healthy food choices. In the long run, helping a patient who is coming to physical therapy, for example, with a shoulder injury, um, prevent a future heart attack could be the most valuable thing that we can do for this patient. Please check out the references for more detailed information about this presentation. Thank you.